Ah, bonsoir tout le monde. It is week 18 of Cocktails and Conversation, your favourite assignation with two of your favourite hosts, Mark Tuberty and Brittany Ern, and me, Nick Luck, all the way from Teddington, South West London. But across here, via Brooklyn, where Mark is sweltering, to where Brittany is glowing on the West Coast, it is warm, 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 isn't it? It is warm everywhere. Mark, how hot is it where you are? You know, it's not as bad as it's been. It's kind of upper 70s, but, you know, we have had our fair share of heat waves recently. But, you know, all the better for cool cocktails, I'd say. You couldn't it. It more right. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's not as breezy today. I think that's the issue. It's getting a little humid, so the air is just kind of sitting there on you. Yeah. But back outside, other than that, I mean, we can't be complaining. Come on now. Right. Uh, even, even I have no complaints, and London is not equipped for temperatures in the high 90s. In fact, one of our producers, Caitlin, said to me, it's not possible. It never gets that hot in England. I promise you it has been that warm. The racing's going to get hot here next week with the winning you're in for the Breeders' Cup Classic, the Jump on International. I think it'll rate one of the highest races in the world yet again this year with this monster gay ath going up against Lord North for, for John Gosden. But, Brittany, nothing, nothing is going to eclipse the performance of Tis the Law last week. Wowee. Wow, we is the right way to describe it. His performance in the Travers gave me chills. I mean, you've got a horse that's been so dominant up until now, and then he has to go a mile and a quarter for the first time. And, you know, a lot of people probably didn't want to take him on because of how dominant he's been, but I just thought he was sensational. He does everything so easy, and a lot of people are saying, well, you know, he gets the trip, or I think he makes his own luck. I think he's just that much better that he doesn't find himself in these hair situations. I cannot wait to see him in the starting gate on the first Saturday in September for Barkley Tag, who's just a true class act um, for the Kentucky Derby, which is three weeks away. I know that sounds so strange to say, but uh, it was a very, very impressive run. Oh, it was phenomenal. You so rarely see a horse geared down like that on, on the main track and just quickening up again at the end of the race. And he galloped out. He could have gone around again. He didn't look tired at all. That is one happy horse that truly loves what he does. So tis the law. An art collector I thought was impressive in the Ellis Park Derby. Um, that horse, a, a local hope for Tom Drury and, and looking forward to seeing those two facing off. But e, tis the law just seems to breathe rarefied air, it seems like. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of winning your in races here in the UK next week at York, not just the Judmont International that I mentioned, which of course features Kamako. We'll be talking to his owner, Sheikh Farhad Al Thani, will be a special guest on this show a little bit later on. But also the Yorkshire Oaks on Thursday, featuring Love, the best three year old filly in Europe, and the Coolmore Nunthorpe Stakes on Friday, which is a five furlong race and a win in your end for the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. Before we carry on, uh, Brittany and Mark, mm -hmm. we haven't done too much mask chic during the course of this, oh. uh, of this show. Would but, you like me to go get my masks? Uh, well, it, it, what, yeah, it wasn't like I had a poncho okay. for seeing you in a, in a mask particularly, but it, here comes Mark. I just want to, you show me, I'll show you right. mine if you show me yours. Okay. Okay. Well, so you guys are going to understand this is especially perfect for me because let me show you. This is my mask. And this is basically a flap for a straw to go in. Can you see that? <laughs> oh, that is so good. That so is prepared. So I like yours, Nick. <laughs> so what is that? If you, can, that if, you can, if you can still hear me, um, this was sent to me by Weatherbees, who are the administrators of racing in, in Britain. Uh, so they're like the racing secretariat. And they sent me this, and this uh, these are my racing silks. Oh, that's sweet. Nice. It's really difficult to hear you, so maybe keep it on the rest of the show. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you can you can These wear my, that every those week. Those are my right? racing silks. There you go. Okay, so I'll just keep <laughs> I'll just keep that on, uh, Brittany, and you can introduce our first guest. Perfect. I, I was gifted some beautiful Breeders' Cup silk mask that I will share with us on uh, share with everybody on the next show. But yes, uh, he has been waiting patiently to be introduced. That is trainer Kenny McPeak, who is living the life up in Saratoga. Kenny, thanks for joining us. How are you? No, my pleasure. It's a beautiful night here. Not hot at all. Hey, oh, man. look at that. I mean, <laughs> this this is perfection. This is the life we all need to be living right now. Can we, I, Kenny, you showed us earlier. Can you flip the camera and just show everybody what you're doing? Oh, my God. Look at that. 
Anybody that's never been out on Saratoga Lake should try it. Say hello to my wife, Sherry. Hi, guys. Hi, hey, Sherry. Hey, Sherry. Hey, Our big dog, Sonny's inside out here. But anyway, um, here. Saratoga Lake is, is um, and I said it earlier, he's a Goldilocks Lake. There's Sonny. He loves oh. <laughs> He'd rather be in the lake than hanging out with I'm us. I'm sure. sure. Yeah. But um, it, it's a Goldilocks Lake. It's not too big. It's not too small. It's five minutes to Saratoga Race Course. Um, it's not unusual on dark day that a lot of the jockeys and trainers and even owners mm -hmm. show up out on the lake on their boats. And we go to a place called Sandy Bottom, which is about it's about three foot of water. It sits on the corner of the lake, and you can park your boat out there and eat and drink, play volleyball. Um, you know, even even on days um, it, when it's not dark day, it's pretty busy out there. On mm -hmm. a Saturday, it's completely packed with a lot of people that are local. But um, but um, he's um, that's Sunny you're hearing in the background. But it, it's, it's a great spot, and and next time you're in Saratoga, when you get back up here after all this is past us make an effort to go out on the lake. It's really, really beautiful. Uh, oh, Kenny, we've been yeah. uh, keep, keeping track of some of the best backgrounds of the guests of this show. And I got to say, you might be in the lead right now. Mm -hmm. I, well, think. I don't know what that's <laughs> worth, but I'll take it. Yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> shout out on cocktails and conversations. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you how Saratoga is going, but you've sort of answered the question in, in that frame. Uh, how are the horses? We try to make it into a working vacation. You know, you come up here, you work hard, you get to visit with a lot of your clients. You do a lot of nice dinners. We went to 15 Church the other night. Um, the horses are doing great. They always do really well up here, typically. Um, Sonny's trying to visit with a little gift here. But, oh, um, please let him. We always love uh, the, horse, uh, the dogs being... I got my last addition. shirt on, too. <laughs> Every, every meeting, every bite. Oh, what? That's cute. How many years have you been uh, going up to Saratoga, Ken? Oh, gosh. Um, almost 30. Yeah, almost 30 years. Um, thir I think the first year I came up here, I bought a horse in 1989 up here. I don't know if that's aging myself or not, but, um, but it's always been great. Um, it's tough racing. You know, you better come to come to a bat it's it's tough i mean you better bring really good horses which we typically can pick out the horses that we want to bring that we think are going to be competitive and um that's easy enough this year logistically was really tough um we had 25 30 horses allotted to come up here and um through it all we had to we had to adjust it because uh staff we couldn't bring enough people up um you know, we, we've got seven here right now. Going to probably up that to eight by the weekend. And um, staffing, because of all the pandemic, has been the hardest part because you've got to get the testing. You've got to make sure that everybody's in good order. Um, moving all those people is difficult. And because we're a Kentucky-based operation, um, it's a little bit more – it's pro more problematic logistically for us um, mm -hmm. because our base is in Churchill and Keeneland. Gosh. I mean, so many adjustments have had to be made this year. It's uh, strange, doesn't even begin to describe 2020. But you mentioned some of the talented horses that you've brought up to compete. This weekend, you have two in the Alabama. Got to start with Swiss Skydiver. When you, because she's always been, she's precocious, she's consistent. But when you first started working with her, did you have the thought that she was going to be something special? Um, she never got out worked early in her two year old preparation. Um, she outworked everything she looked at, looked in the eye. Um, unfortunately, she chipped an ankle um, uh, early summer, so we so we had to put her on the shelf for a period, and she didn't make the races until the fall. So that's one of those things that you know it happens. We've got it. It was small. It was very very minor, but it was one of those things for her long term was the thing to do, and uh, so she came around a little bit later, and. Um, Getting her to two turns has been the hardest part because as a two-year-old, I was never able to find the proper two-turn race for her. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had, you'd probably heard about her a little sooner. But once we've gone two turns, she's been hickory. 
absolute dominant sword. And I got to see her at Santa Anita in the flesh. This is an incredible um, horse. But you took her against the boys. Was that an easy decision? Did you feel like she was the right type to take on males? What kind of horse do you have to have to take on a female? You know, the thing about that was is that I was trying to keep the two fillies separated. I was really hoping that on Bhutan would have an opportunity to shine, which she did. She ran well. Uh, we looked at the past performances on the bluegrass, and we felt that there was only one horse to beat. And, um, and that one horse was obviously our collector. <clears throat> I told Peter I would love to win the bluegrass with a filly. I think it'd be really cool. Um, there was no guarantee that she was even going to win the Ashland. I thought that race was coming up tough, relatively tough, too, maybe tougher than the Colts. And, um, you know, in hindsight, no regrets. Um, our collector's a really good horse. He's on form, and Tommy Drury's done a great job with him. Um, Brian Hernandez chose he, – he had a choice between Art Collector and my filly, mm -hmm. and um, and he chose correctly. And, uh, look, um, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I think it's fun. Uh, I think part of racing horses is that kind of scenario. They're, they're not scared to run enabled against Colts, are they? Nope. So, so – <laughs> So what's the difference? So anyway, and plus we got a big weight break. So yeah, it was that's all fun. It. it was all fun. That's it. You know, if you if you look at the record of Phillies against Colts in global racing at the very highest level, you'd be returning yourself a, a pretty healthy profit as well. Earlier in the week, Kenny, you said in the in the TDN, you thought this race was a great setup for Ambutant, and it wouldn't surprise you if she if she upset the other Phillies. Is that because of the way she's been working over the track? We've planned all year that that Ambutant would be a really good. Alabama Philly mm -hmm. um, and, and once again I hate running them against each other however Swiss Skydiver deserves to win a grade one and she has continued to be you know solid she she loves her work she eats well it, you know he, Sherry who's sitting here has always said run them if they're doing good don't be scared run them and she's right you got to run them sometimes and um, it's a great race Peter Callahan's a New Yorker um, it would, he would love it to win the Alabama. Does it compromise our chances in the Oaks? I don't, I don't like coming back in three weeks, but, um, you know, it is what it is. And I think she can handle three weeks and the other Philly, you know, you've still got to manage the horses to what's right for both of them. You know, yeah, she's still I, on some of the Kentucky Derby leaderboards. Is there any possibility to run her there? It's slim. Um, you know, the fact that she got points. Uh, you know, you try to think three steps ahead in this game. Uh, think about it. What major Philly race is after the Oaks? They're in one. The Distaff? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean it, it, if you go into October, there really isn't a major three-year-old Philly race out there. So who's to say, let's say we won the Alabama, we won the Oaks. I mean, and look, I'm a dreamer, you know. That's why you get in horse racing, right? Yep. If if she won the Alabama and she won the Oaks, why not run her in the Freakness? Hmm. Well, yeah. But Good, cool. if, Love I that. Any, if I don't have any points to get in the Freakness, then I can't get in. So it's now just I that have, kind of... Now I have points. Yeah. And it's just that kind of year that keeps throwing you these curveballs and then you've got to yep. figure out a creative way of playing them. We've got a great question here and, I, and it's giving me a good excuse to mention the horse. James Paraguay said, I had a wager on Kenny Sarava in the 2002 Belmont still bragging about the win return. I'd imagine he's still spending the win return as well. <laughs> that can't have been too many more mind-blowing, dumb striking moments in your career than that. Yeah, you know what? Um... That, that was when things kind of came together. That horse was really on form for that race. Um, you know, uh, he beat he beat Medagli Dioro in a photo, and and he um, he was right that day. You know, they moved him to Baffert after that. I don't know if you you all remember that. I know I do, but um, you could probably mention Sarava to Bob, and he doesn't like hearing that name because he had a hard time getting that horse to run. But uh, but anyway, it was a great moment. Um, I want to go back to the Phillies again. Well, just you before you do, before you do, before you do go back to the Phillies, we're going to have a little look. Just let's have a look at, at, at and torture Bob again with the with Sarava's Belmont. <laughs> <laughs> but 
because this was insane. I remember this horse starting his career in in the UK and not really thinking he was any good at all. Kenny, what's going through your mind right now as you like when you were watching this live? You know, um, that that horse had a lot of little issues, and a horse trainer's job is is to figure out all the issues and and solve the problems. <clears throat> he had he had a little of this and a little of that, and if you knew if you knew, I always said he was like a leaky ship, and if you knew where to patch all the holes, he'd float for a day. And um, he had a foot issue, and he had some hawks, and he had you know you had to you had he had assist, and he, he, you had to really be careful, um, and. We knew him. We knew him well. I ran, I ran the horse four times, two wins, two seconds. And that's the only times I ever ran the horse. And, um, you know, that's our job. And, and that's the fun thing about, I guess it's called the art of, of horsemen and training horses is, is knowing all the details. And um, it's fun. It's the fun part. It's mm -hmm. things I learned when I was probably the first 10 years that I trained. I trained nothing but mostly claiming horses and average horses and you learn a lot of lessons i'm going to say down in the trenches and there there are a lot of really really good horsemen that are in america and and europe and worldwide that that never had the opportunity with better horses so um you know you do what you do and you learn as you go and and he was a horse that i think a lot of lessons that we had had we learned from and and we uh, we got it done it was fun you um you wanted to go back to talk about the phillies do you know why R Genuine Risk ran in the Kentucky Derby in 1980? I know you all were probably a little young then. But um, but Genuine Risk was dodging a filly named Bold and Determined who she felt like she couldn't beat in the Oaks. And so they didn't run in the Oaks because Bold and Determined was such a freaky good filly. And Bold and Determined won the Oaks and Genuine Risk ran in the Derby thinking that the Colts weren't that tough and won the Derby. So, so how these things unfold, there is there is absolutely no black and white in the game. It's all gray, and you can't be scared. And I think Swiss Skydiver, if she runs a freaky good race this weekend, and she needs to do that, and there's no guarantee it's going to happen, but if she runs a freaky good race, we won't rule out the Derby. But really, our eyeballs are on the Preakness. You don't strike me as somebody that would duck anybody. Has that always been your main mentality? <laughs> you said you have to take a shot. That's what this game is all about. Well, um, you want the long story? Do we have time? Do you have sure. time? We have all the time in the world. Yeah, sure. I got more Casa Amigos right here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I didn't fall down. My camera did. So, so um, in 1996, I got a bellyache. I was at the yearling sale at Basic Tipton, and something wasn't right. And by that night, I was in the hospital. <clears throat> by the next morning, they had operated on me. I got a eight to ten inch incision where they opened me up, did exploratory surgery, and the next morning, the surgeon said, "Do you know how close you were to dying?" Tell me, doc. It was actually a woman surgeon, and she said six to 12 hours she said if we had waited you would have died of gangrene and peritonitis oh, wow so it was a it was a misdiagnosed rupture dependence so i got off the operating table i got out of the hospital i was in bed for almost a month trying to heal up and you know wayne lucas said it he, he, i think he stole the quote and i love wayne I hope he's okay, by the way. Yeah. Live every day like it's your last. One day you'll be right. You can't have any fear. Mm -hmm. Everything's been a bonus since then. So wow. I don't I don't have much tolerance for, for clients that are difficult, horses that are average. You can't be scared of running a big race. You have to enjoy life every day. We try to. And... You know, really, it's only a horse race. And in the scheme of things, I mean, here there are people dying of a pandemic right now. We're worrying about the Alabama. And there are people that are struggling. There are people that can't pay their bills or can't pay their rent. So, you know, 
we got to put it in perspective. Well, well said. Well, well said. Good. And you, you, you strike me as, you, as someone who's, you know, always. You talk about your your horses, and you said you you know you don't you don't want to train bad horses for for bad clients, but you're, you're someone I've seen you around your horses in your your beautiful place in in Kentucky, and it seems as though you always treat them like they're good until they prove otherwise, rather than the other way around. Well, you've got to you've got to deal with. I mean, anybody that buys horses, and whether you're an owner or a trainer, you deal with a lot of average horses to get to a really really good one. But even an, even an average talented horse, you need to make sure that they find an opportunity to race, even if it's at a B or a C circuit, and and that's okay. And we sell we sell the ones that, that aren't as fast as the Swiss Skydivers and the Envoutants and some of the others we've had over the years. And but but we definitely give them an opportunity to to do what they do, whether it's you know with another trainer in Texas or. Louisiana or wherever it might be, but um, yeah, you have to you have to treat them all really well, and you treat them even really well while they're in your hands. That's the only thing we can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and doing things that little bit differently has has always you know marked you out. You you brought horses to Europe before anybody else did, pretty much in the in the states, and uh, enjoyed that. You you train on your own farm as well as on the track, which does that give you a big advantage? I don't know that it gives me a big advantage, but it does give me a better ability to take care of the horses that we have. If they if they need a certain situation or a certain environment, then we can provide that. You know, one of my goals in life is, is to have a division over there at Newmarket. I'd love to have a division over there. I think economically, you they've, they've got to get the prize money a lot better over there before you could justify it. But, um, you know, having the farm and a paddock and uh round pens and being able to gallop on the grass um horses love that stuff and um the key is keeping them happy and being able to adjust when they're not and you know finding a good horse is the hardest part we've got sales coming up that's going to be really intense september is going to be the most intense month of my life coming up i mean we've got 17 days of sales right following the Oaks and the Derby. So do you, do you enjoy the busyness of it all? Or is that to you quite hectic having all of that lumped into one month? Well, I enjoy the relaxing moments that we're dealing with right now because it's a window to be able to say a little bit of time out and breathe a little bit because I, seven horses for me, I can do that blindfolded. Um, and so we're trying to, just you know my daughter's up here um you know share we've had family up for the summer Mm -hmm. but when we you know after the alabama we go home and then it gets really intense for the for the fall but i'm used to that and and i thrive on it and um the work we do in the sales is more in some ways more important than the work we do in the mornings or in the afternoons because if you don't have a good sale then you don't have a good crop for the next season mm-hmm. or the season after that. So it's all like building blocks. And right. so we have to have um, every, every, I guess you could say, you've got to check every box to make it all work. Yeah. Um, you know, Swiss Skydiver was hip number 2997, somebody told me this morning. We got to look at 3,000 horses to get to her. Um, Worth it. Okay. <laughs> uh, Kenny. I know you haven't got too long left, and I wish I was we could kind of, talk all night. <laughs> uh, so do I, and I, I was kind of wondering when and whether to, to to bring this up. But people talk about your Breeders' Cup record. I would conjecture there aren't many people with a better Breeders' Cup record. In some ways, you've had thirty-one runners. Eighteen of them have hit the board. Eighteen yeah. out of thirty-one have hit the board, and not a winner. It's That's just. It's the best and worst statistic in U- U.S. horse racing. You know, but that's okay because as long as the horses ran well, some of them were unlucky. Um, but you know, Frankel, Bobby Frankel went over forty till he won one. Yeah, yeah. and look you at know, uh, look, Sadler. Those, John Sadler. Are, those are tough races. We've led some horses over there that ran really well, and I think even even running third or better in the Breeders' Cup is like a win, and we've approached them like wins. 
So I'm not overly worried about, you know, the, the trophies, although we're going to continue to take them over. And I'll tell you this, I almost guarantee you we're going to check that box before the end of the year. Yes, so, come on. I love it. Have you seen the two-year-olds we're running? Give us the name. <laughs> Crazy Beautiful. Okay. I mean, I, we've got a fantastic We're writing them down. Drop Anchor. Yes. And I've got some other ones that we haven't even unleashed yet. So, you know, that's part of it. You know, you got to have a you got to have a base of, of good horses behind you and I got some great people I work for. I mean, um, I can't even begin to list them all. I mean, Scott Leeds, Peter Callahan, Gonzalo Torrealba. I've got horses for Phoenix, and I know that's controversial right now, but he's been very honorable to me. I don't have any problem with him. Um, you know, there's a list of a lot of Paul Fireman, who I've had a bit of a slow run for lately, but he had Restless Rider. And, um, you know, we've got so many other people that Tommy Lewis, who had Signal Man, um, you know, and I like really working for nice people. And right now we've got those people. It's a team effort. Um, Kenny, this has been such a pleasure. I think that you left us all with something we really need to hold close to our heart, and that's live each day to the fullest. Um, that, that really, we need those reminders from time to time. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, good luck this weekend. I want some more yeah. stories later, so we might have to bring it back. <laughs> Sounds good. I'd be glad to come Kenny, back. take care. Thanks so much, and best okay. of luck. Mm -hmm. We'll see uh, Kenny on the uh, on NBC this weekend, next weekend, all the way through to the, the Breeders' Cup. I've noted them down. Crazy Beautiful and, and Drop Anchor, Brittany. Okay. That would be quite something. I love the... I love what he had to say about taking a shot because this is what you're in the game for and mm. his confidence in saying, we're going to... We might check off that box sooner rather than later, and I hope so. He's been so good for the game. He takes horses overseas, runs them wherever uh, across the country, just a big supporter. So I'm... Easy guy to root for. And I, and I know you, and I appreciate, and you appreciate because you've been around horses all your life, that you have to look after these horses as best you possibly can. You have to care for them as best you possibly can. You have to run them in the right races. Well, well they say keep yourself in the best company and your, your horses in the worst. You mustn't overface them. But we love people who at the top level, they have a go. And as he said about his wife, Sherry, she was encouraging him, run them when they're right because mm -hmm. you never quite know what's around the corner. And I, I, th I think I'd like to think that that's a, a strategy that's been been upheld by our our next guest this evening has mm -hmm. he's he's proved himself nothing if not a, a tremendous sportsman in the in the decade and a bit that he's been involved with thoroughbred racing at the at the highest class his yeah. um his maroon and gold silks have been seen successful <laughs> all across the world from dunedin and the melbourne cup to runners in the breeders cup to european three-year-old champion roaring lion here he is shake farhad al thani shake farhad good evening good evening Sheikh, uh, thank you so much for joining us i know it is very late where you are <laughs> I'm, I'm the same as Nick. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say I know ne I never get thanked for staying up this late. No, but yeah. he doesn't. He doesn't. I, but our guests do. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I think I think that's right, though, isn't it? You're you're someone who, in that relatively short space of time, has has enjoyed taking on the the big challenges and and has has wanted to get out there to to all the big shows. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. But uh, I think I've learned as well at the same time that. You can't, as you said, you can't overface a horse. And we might, I've done that um, in previous years. Um, and looking at it now, I've learned, we've all learned. Um, and I think you have to, as you said, place your horses in the worst company. But when it comes to the big races, the Breeders' Cup, there's no worst company there. <laughs> That's the elite racing. Has your, your approach to racing internationally changed at all uh, with that in mind? Yes, uh, Brittany, no, we, uh, we've changed a lot. Um, um, our main focus is still the, uh, the UK, um, but um, I think the world is now um, international and um, we've grown in America a lot in the last three years. Um, and I think we're going to grow more over there as well. Um, it's great racing, good prize money. Um, yeah, the sales is, um, is very good out there as well. So. I think the model, the racing model in America is very good. Uh, before we come on to talk about this very special horse who runs in next week's Jabon International, which is a Breeders' Cup Challenge Series race, Cameco, I, I wanted to you to tell everybody why the Breeders' Cup and particularly Breeders' Cup in Southern California has now 
an indelible place in your in your heart in your life well that's where i met my wife in uh, denmark we just got denmark um and uh look that, that's the, i think that's the biggest win of them all really um, um so yeah that's that's why but uh, i think readers cup uh, to be honest everywhere it's, uh, in every venue not just in california i do enjoy uh, the keenland readers cup as well um um church of downs as well that's the the, the other two i've been to as well so the connection between you and the United States is a is a long held and, and very deep one anyway. But your best horses have come from the the US as well. Uh, Roaring Lion, who we'll talk about in a moment, but but Cameco at, at Keeneland Sales. And am I right in saying that Sheikha Melissa actually picked out Cameco? Yes, she she no she did. Um, uh, we have Dave Dredvers and all my team that you know um, do a short list, um, and I go through them all. Um, I. I liked I liked to come for one a, as a physical as well, and um, lucky enough she was there. It was our our honeymoon actually. <laughs> it was our first trip, um, and um, she came to the sales with me. And I said to her, "We love this horse. What do you think of him?" She said, "Yeah, I love him as well." And thankfully she bid on him, and we got him. Uh, and what's the story behind the name? Because she not come up with the name too. He did as well, and um, it's uh, about the old fable when. The, uh, to, to the tortoise always beats the hare. So mm -hmm. she said, even if you call him tortoise, it, it, um, Kamiko is a Japanese inter interpretation to um, a, t a tortoise. Um, and she's right. And they all went, they all went to, the, to the Guinness and he showed them who's fastest at the end. So for those who haven't been keeping an eye on European racing this this year. Kamako is uh, already a, a classic winner. He won the 2000 guineas at Newmarket. Since when, Sheikh Fahad, he's not enjoyed the best of luck. He's run tremendously well in the Derby over a mile and a half, and then again, uh, back in the Sussex Stakes over a mile, but he never got he never got clear sailing last time. How, how frustrated were you? Well, I think, I think all the field were frustrated in uh, Epsom because uh, the, they let a very good sports uh, get loose in the front. And I, I knew when they were turning for home, um, I looked to uh, David next to me and I said to him, I think the race is over, the winners in front, we're, we're all running for our places there. It was a great ride by Emmett, uh, Emmett McNamara, and he's a very good, very good jockey and judged it perfectly. But if you look at the fractions, he didn't go overly fast, but it looked to the naked eye he did, but he just um, got his clock right on the day. Um, in the Sussex, as we, as you all, you've all seen, unfortunately, um, he had absolutely no luck. He never went out of second gear. That, Oshin said to me, my jockey afterwards said to me, boss, I never got out of second gear. Um, and maybe it's a blessing in disguise because um, he came out of it um, like a nice piece of work. So um, no damage done in that race, and uh, he's bouncing and kicking. So Andrew said to me, I think we really need to go to the judgment. And that's next week. Uh, I think I think it's the best race we've had running run in Europe this year. I think um, I, I I agree with you. Gaeth is going to be a very hard horse to beat. Um, it, it seems like this year he's uh, uh, improved in no end. Um, there's also also Lord North in it. Um, John 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 knows very very well uh, which horse to take to the job box, as he did with Roaring Lion. Um, so it's not going to be it's not going to be an easy race, but we're very confident, and um, no, we really like our chances. Well, you bring up Roaring Lion, a horse that I know meant so much to you and your family, a horse that we lost far too soon. But when you look back on on his career and um, just what he what he gave to the entire outfit, what what do you think of what are specific moments just really jump out when you reflect upon Roaring Lion? Well, really two things, um, both for Roaring Lion and Kamiko. The firstly is uh, the first sale I've ever um, attended myself was Keeneland Sales about 10 or 11 years ago. So Keeneland Sales ha has always produced uh, our two champions, really, uh, the biggest champions. Uh, in terms of Roaring Lion, I think it's going to be very hard to uh, replace him. Um, can try all our lives, but he was tremendous. He, his courage was unbelievable. Um, I think, um, as John said, um, 
he thought it was all a game until he went to the Dante, um, which is the Derby trial in York. Um, and then he put it all, all in together and knew what the job was about. And since, since, since after that, other than Derby, which he didn't say, unfortunately, um, he didn't look back. Um, I mean, to go, to, to have a horse, um, excel at a mile and a quarter in the eclipse in the judgment. And then ask him to come down to a mile in the QE2, which is the uh, elite mile race we have all year uh, on Champions Day, uh, and expect him to go and be as effective. Uh, it was it was amazing by John Gosden, to be honest. I think, he, uh, yeah, as we can see, the Judmont uh, International there. Um, I mean, when I was standing at the one pole, and I couldn't believe how well he was traveling. He was a beautiful horse and, and so brave as well. And, and he absolutely loved York. He was fantastic in the Dante. He was fantastic this day. And he beat a, a quality feel. And you, you had a go at the, the Breeders' Cup Classic. It didn't come off. But, uh, you know, full marks to you for, for, for having a crack at it. No, but uh, Nick, but we knew that the horse is going to be um, uh, is going to be retired uh, after the um, um, uh, at the end of the year, and I spoke to John Gosden and said to him, would you like to try the Breeders' Cup Classic? I don't have any, um, uh, I don't understand, I haven't had a horse in the race, so I don't know what to what to expect. Um, John said to me, it's, a, it's one of the hardest races, but for sure, if he handles the dirt, he's as good as any. Um, but we didn't know if he would or not, and uh, we tried it. Unfortunately, it didn't come, didn't come, didn't come up. This is a, a lovely picture after the Queen Elizabeth II stakes, and there is Her Majesty presenting you with the with the trophy. Uh, the images that many people will remember from that day are, are slightly grainier, and it, it's you you celebrating. <laughs> yeah, I know absolutely. No, uh, that that, um, that photo uh, means a lot to me. Um, uh, to have my brothers there, or my brothers there, uh, mm -hmm. and my wife was uh, amazing, really. And Her Majesty to give us the trophy was even icing on the cake. Uh, and this is for those who who aren't aware. This is a, a day, British Champions Day, that you and your your brothers have sponsored since its inception back in two thousand and eleven. And of course, Frank was one of the first two yeah. Champions Days. This is our tenth year this yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, uh, and yes, no. I to be honest, the, the Champions Day came about from the Breeders' Cup, actually. Because I've, grew, I've grown up watching racing, and I watched um, the Breeders' Cup and knew that this is the finale of basically um, um, the U.S. racing in terms of the quality. And when I got into racing over here, I asked uh, David Redvers, my manager, I said to him, what is the finale of uh, the U.K. racing? I said, we don't have a set date for it, but we have uh, great racing, and uh, the Ch Champion States was at uh, Newmarket. You have the QE2 in Ascot. Um, I said to him, could there be a chance of getting all the good races together and having it at the end of the, um, end, uh, at the, end of the year, basically? Um, and thankfully, um, uh, we, uh, well, the, you know, um, um, uh, the BHA, uh, Great British Racing, and all worked very hard to um, accept Champions Day. And I think from day one, We've had nothing but champions and great races. I, I don't remember a day that I went there and didn't think, oh, wow, that was an amazing race or not. So that that day had all those layers of significance when, when Roaring Lion, your involvement in the day, your involvement in the horse, your wife's involvement in the horse, the fact that he was European three-year-old champion, the fact that you were sitting in the royal box, the fact that the queen encouraged you to cheer because you were you were reluctant and a bit locked up with a furlong to run. Her Majesty is a great supporter of, uh, of our operation from day one of, my, of myself as well. Um, she taught me a lot about racing and uh, uh, it, was, it was thankfully that we, I was sitting next to her. She asked us to, to her box to watch the race and I was getting a bit anxious. She could see me, but I didn't want to start jumping up and down. And she looked at me and said, to me, you know, uh, you're allowed to cheer your horse here. And I think she, I think she had a lot of uh, fun watching that. So from then on, do you allow yourself to cheer? Well, try try and contain it, but yes, as as you know, once when you have a horse running, especially in the good races, you definitely do cheat. You are we called you the, the ultimate sportsman. You truly are 
running your horses ar around the world. What is it, in your opinion, about international racing that can be um, so interesting, so dynamic, so uh, diverse that perhaps more people should give it a shot? Um, I think uh, the world is getting smaller. It's much easier to travel a horse from here to go to um, um, America, to California, to um, uh, Churchill, to Keeneland, and have it run, get back on that flight, and come back over here. I remember when Dunedin won the Melbourne Cup for me in, in Australia, the cost back then to send the horse was immense. It was like, I think, 10 times what it is now, which, which shows you like it's getting better. Um, especially with the, the Breeders' Cup, I think, which is good, is that uh, if you win a, a win and you're in race, even over here, um, the, the allowances that you get for the horse to ship out is great. Um, that's why we have um, um, the, the Learjet, who won the Norfolk. He is definitely going to the Breeders' Cup. Um, and, and that would be a nice. I think he's got a good chance at, at it as well. So, so we're looking forward to that. And hopefully, if um, Kamiko wins the judgment, we might even consider him going to the Breeders' Cup. We've talked about your growing involvement in U.S. racing, especially here in Southern California. Uh, there is a lot of buzz surrounding a young horse that has yet to debut with trainer Simon Callahan. What should we know about North Pole and, and uh, specifically the name? Is there any attachment to it or just a good name? No, I th it's just a good name. To be honest, I, I, I sit down with my team, all of, all of them here, and we spitball names. And I, uh, I've got to give the credit to Bryony, who works at the office, who found the name. And I said to her, yeah, I like that name very much. And uh, um, Simon said to me, I think we've got a nice bunch of horses here. Um, and he said, Pioneer, the pioneer of the Nile, I think, might be the best of them. So uh, I said to him, OK, let's call him North Pole if, if you like that. And he said, yeah, he loves it as well. And I think he might be debuting in two weeks' time. Or even less. I, th I think he's got an entry now, so maybe next week. Actually, do you are you able to temper expectations if a trainer tells you this horse could be something special? Do you wait and see it first? Uh, well, you get to know the trainers and you get to know the vibes they give you. Some of them are over optimistic, and some of them are very pessimistic. And I've got uh, the whole range of trainers in between as well. So I, I, I managed to read uh, between the lines of what they were expecting. Go on. Who, who is at either end of the spectrum? Who trains uh, for I, you I, at the moment? I'm under the bus here, Nick. <laughs> I um, can I, would, it, would it be yeah. fair? To, uh, the, the one thing I've always thought about um, John Gosden, who's probably your, one of your most high-profile trainers, is he's brilliant at managing everyone's expectations i'm not saying he's a pessimist but he's very very effective at managing your expectations at keeping you kind of in the right place yes but also he doesn't uh, miss in terms of uh, look if, if, if the horse isn't good enough he'll tell me look it's not good enough uh, for your operation or so we need to move it on at the end of the day uh, um running 100 i think we've got 140 horses in training or so worldwide so you, you can't keep everything, and you, you've got to have trainers that tell you, no, you don't need the, you don't need X, Y, and Z. That, um, not saying that they're bad, but there's other owners down the line that might. And I've sold two Group One winners that uh, trainers thought they weren't good, and then they went on to win Grade Ones. Sometimes horses surprise you. I, I want to ask, because it seems like you have such a wonderful relationship with Asheen Murphy, who has really taken England, wherever he goes, by storm, truly. Uh, did you always um, have a relationship with him or see great talent in this young burgeoning star, I'd say? Yes, uh, when, when he was still claiming, I don't know how to, what the, what's the wording in America, but he was still... Yeah, when he, when he, was, a, when he was a bug, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he rode in a race for me because we were short of jockeys everywhere. Um, uh, and he rode in a Group Two race, uh, hot, a, whole, a horse called Hot Streak, and he managed to beat Ryan Moore, who picked my other horse in the race. And in fairness, I thought he gave him a great ride, like a, a professional's ride. Um, and from I think the year after we signed him up as our second jockey, um, Andrea Zini was our first. 
Um, and to be honest, um, since then, me and him had a very, have a very close relationship, and he comes, uh, uh, he, look, he stays with me in that in new market when he when I'm here and uh, around, and uh, we discuss racing uh, through the night, and he gives me his feedback. And, and I think he's very talented in knowing the horses and knowing when to push them, and when knowing when we have to back off a horse uh, or not try and attempt a race here or there. I mean, the, the greatest compliment is, I think, John Gosden. John Gosden likes him a lot and uh, um, uh, listens to him when he when he says to when he says to John, John, we think, I think we should be better off going to one race instead of the other. I think um, they get along very well together, and in fairness, he gets along with all my trainers, which is very important. He's got. He's obviously, you know, really. Um, blossomed as well as a as a speaker and a great communicator with the media in the in the last couple of years as well as his writing talent but would you agree that he he's just got that little bit of edge about him that good sportsmen have you know there's not there's nothing bland about the sheep no. there's always something happening you know it's he's as active there's always something going on he's very active but he's not, he's young nick as well he's young he's uh enthusiastic about the sport which is great you don't get many people especially over here um uh, as Nick knows, um, jockeys have to go, not this year, but usually, they, they can do two meetings a day and they have to get a, get in a car and drive three hours one way to go to one race course and then drive another four hours to go to the other race course, which is, uh, as as you can see, every, doing that every day might become very tiring. But for him, I think he takes it on well. Um, um, and that's, I think, also one of his great assets, really. I, I thought what John Fulton said, um, and I kind of wanted to expand on, he said he has a good grasp of how to be successful in this sport. I'm impressed. You you were, you have your pulse on so many different racing jurisdictions and very involved in being a supporter of this sport. Um, what do you think it is that, that horse racing just in general could spend more time focusing on? Is it the youth of the sport? Is it, um, you know, is it marketing it better? I mean, for you, what, what do you think we could do better? Um, look, I think um, uh, in America, you've, you've done a great job about it um, in terms of marketing to, to everyone. You go to the sales, whether it's Keeneland or Phasic, and you saw, uh, you see how how many diverse owners go there to to be buying horses. Mm -hmm. Over in Europe, I think they can do a, a bit better, really, in terms of marketing the races over here. It would be great, like um, Kenny said earlier, that uh, uh, him trying to have a base new market. Um, that that would be that would be something a good crack if he could, if he can do it. Yeah. That'd <laughs> liven the place up a bit, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Uh, but it's, look, it's, a, it's different racing. We've had it. Uh, Wesley Ward is a great ambassador, I think, for U.S. racing. He brings horses to Royal Ascot and showcases how um, American horses can compete with our, our horses in Europe, um, which is slightly different because um, in America it's more dirt-based than turf-based. Over here, we don't have dirt racing. It's only turf racing and all-weather racing. So. It would be nicer to get to try and make the world even a bit more smaller and have more of the races. Um, but I don't know. Look, I hope if I can help or anyone can help, it's great. You already have, but I, I think that, and you highlighted it, that's what the Breeders' Cup is all about. It's bringing all of these countries together to compete uh, the elite of the sport against each other and take away that prize. And we look forward to it each and every year, I know, because it does make the world seem slightly smaller. Although hopefully this year it won't uh, won't shake things up too much travel-wise. <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, I think this year, uh, I don't know whether we'll be even allowed to get to uh, to, to the Breeders' Cup uh, or the sales in America, which is going to be very annoying if we can't we can't go and find another Kamiko or Roaring Lion. It would be very sad, but um, I hope things get better by by that time. Aiden Butler says, "Move to California, please." <laughs> <laughs> Let's say my wife would agree with that. <laughs> it's a it's an amazing thing i i was just i was just reflecting on how how you you know you've said many times you really got interested in racing watching it on the tv when you were a student in london and i'd imagine you had all sorts of different ideas as to how your 
how your how the sort of leisure side of your life might go and what sort of pastimes you might have and how you might kind of um immerse yourself and, and indulge yourself but did you ever look back and think this is a crazy crazy journey i've been on you know being oh. involved with all these horses across the, the globe and from melbourne cups to the breeders cup to everything in the uk it's it's pretty insane isn't it from, from it a standing is. start a hundred percent it is but i think the 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 one thing that made it all work as well is um, I found uh, David Redvers to manage my operation, and I think it's great that uh, it was him to do it because, he, as you see, his achievements are very good, and he made it fun and he made it, uh, um, you know, work really well. I think we were we had like a forty percent strike rate on year one and uh, three stakes winners in from ten horses, which is which is quite uh, quite an amazing achievement in in the UK, as you know. Um, so. From that, I, I, you know, I, I got bit by the bug, and then, um, and then, and then had my brother's bit as well, and that's how we formed Qatar Racing and said, okay, let's let's give it a good go. What what is uh, the goal for your team? One race, give me one race that you would all just absolutely love to win. Well, when uh, when when I started, it was the Guineas because uh, it was the race, the first race I've ever I, I've ever been to in the UK. Um, and I was in I was in awe of Newmarket and in awe of the race. Um, I said to David, hopefully one year we can have a horse to win it. And I think we fired maybe five or six runners before Kaniku won. So it took us ten years to get there, but thankfully we got there. In terms of going forward, I I actually have a few races that I want to accomplish. I can't say just one race. It'd be it'd be it'd be sad just to have one race and uh, pack up. So. Uh, um, yeah, a derby would be great. A, a Epsom derby or the Kentucky derby um, uh, or a Breeders' Cup as well. Well, I think all three. Yep. You know, yep. By, yeah. the, by I, the end of next year. It's not out of reach. <laughs> You've got to get Messrs. Messrs. Gosden, Balding, and Callahan and Co. on the case, and uh, it'll all come together. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks so much for chatting to us this evening at Sheikh Farhad and, and as Brittany said, staying up till uh, till midnight. I, mu I must say, though, I thought I had a slightly better chance on this show than on my other show, which takes yeah. place at <laughs> nine o'clock in the morning. So when I, I, did, I did go to your other show, Nick. Yeah, I know. I know. And this is one of my single greatest achievements in, yeah. in my uh, career is that when, when I'd asked a few times, David Redvers said to me, you can try as many times as you like. There is one thing you will not do, and you will not get Sheikh Fahad on your program that begins at nine o'clock in the morning. Because, you know, some of us are night owls and some of us are morning people. I'm a, I'm not a morning person particularly. I'm watching, I'm watching my horses race in California. I have to stay up till 3 a.m. in the UK time to watch them. That's, yeah. that's a downside for me. Exactly. Well, a lot for you, Nick. You got to return the favor somehow, some way. <laughs> Oh, that's all right. I think I had knows that there are a myriad ways that that will manifest itself in, in, in months and years to come. I'm proud of that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Tell your lovely wife hello for us. And hey, good luck this weekend. We'll be rooting him home. Thank you very much, guys. Sheikh Fahad, thank you. And uh, Sheikh Fahad's Camaco runs in the John Mott International, which is a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Classic, uh, which I always think is interesting. And he did say it's not impossible that that horse could uh, go Breeders' Cup for whichever the race it might be, mile turf perhaps, uh, later in the year. Mark Tuberty is back. He's back. He's back. He's back. How are you, Squire? Everybody's ready for a cocktail? <laughs> we, we've got a double feature tonight. I'm really excited. This is our first time doing this. But uh, we've got a theme going on as well. So I know we've got some great racing that's happening in New York this weekend, obviously. But if mm -hmm. I'm not wrong, and I could be, because you know I don't know too much about this, but typically we would have some racing in Chicago this time of year as well, the Arlington uh, Williams. That's, oh, a, that's a, Arlington. That's a yeah. sad, sad tale. It is right. a sad tale. So, don't even get us started. You just brought up okay. something very but, but actually, <laughs> this, this is why I don't talk about horses. <laughs> but, well, we don't want to talk about it because Arlington's closing down. What we do yeah. want to probably do, though, is actually, if you want to, if you want to just get a bit of Chicago vibe going, yeah. Brittany and I can reminisce about, you know, not not obviously we won't talk. We'll just silently reminisce while you make the cocktail about a couple of great times in Chicago. Brittany posted a picture yeah. on Facebook today 
and uh, and we can drink to all the great runnings of the Arlington Million there were and say yeah. we miss we miss you Arlington Park. Yeah, You're so absolutely. Arlington. Yeah, I know there's a great horse racing history there, of course, here in New York as well. And there's also a great cocktail sort of tie between the two different areas. So actually, both drinks that I'm going to be making right now were created in Chicago, but popularized in New York. Now, one of them got to keep the name. That's the Chicago Fizz. And the other one sort of lost it to New York. That's the New York Sour. Um, but both drinks are really, really interesting cocktails. And I'm going to go into a cocktail historian right now named David Wondrick. I don't know if I've ever really brought him up before but he's sort of a personal hero of mine. He took the time, he's sort of the cocktail historian in this world. So what he did was he combed through old newspapers and tons of old cocktail books, and he sort of provided the context for where these old recipes came from. And David actually broke it down from the origins of the mixed drink of punch, which used to be enjoyed in royal courts, back when people had time to actually sit around a big punch bowl, sit there all day and finish it. But of course, they didn't always have time for that. When, yeah, when, when we hit the mid 19th century, and of course, America and everywhere, you know, it was bustling, it was very busy. So bartenders had to find a way of recreating something just as tasty that could be made quickly and consumed quickly for their patrons. So both sours and fizzes were sort of kind of these offspring of punch. So the New York sour actually went by a few different names before it became the New York sour. It was the continental sour at one point. It was the Southern Whiskey Sour, and it was even called the Claret Snap because it actually has a little float of red wine on top. So I like that it. drink. Oh, it is a beautiful drink. It's a delicious drink. And we already covered the Whiskey Sour. So we're basically making the same thing, and we're just going to top it with a little red wine. I'm telling you, if you do this at home, it looks absolutely stunning. Uh, the Chicago Fizz has a little bit more going on to it. But here's the cool thing is that when we talk about the fact that both of these styles of drinks, sours and fizzes, Fizzes are basically just sours that have some club soda. It shows that we have this kind of common denominator. And the reason why that's important and why I bring it up is that sometimes you might think if you place a few different orders with a bartender at a bar, how do they go about thinking, how am I going to construct all these different drinks? And one of the things that we do is we think about the drink order. So it could be four or five different drinks and try to identify common elements that we can pour at the same time. So I thought because we're going to be making both drinks simultaneously tonight, we're actually going to build them at the same time. So instead of making one and then making the other, we're going to do exactly what I would do behind the bar, find those common elements and build both drinks together, do a nice double shake. We'll have Nick recite some really cool facts, and then we're going to have two drinks at the same time. I love Sounds like fun? There was some thought behind our madness. Everyone's like, you're waited so long, but this is no, why. No, no, no. We, we intended no, we it don't. all along. Listen, we don't just sh throw the show together. <laughs> There's a format we, that we Nick get somebody we get Nick somebody else to do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So quickly, I'm going to run through what's in each drink, and then you're going to see how we can tie it together. So okay. the New York Sour, very very easy. Maker's Mark, lemon juice, simple syrup, and then later on, we're going to add that little float of red wine. We want something fruity. Uh, so traditionally, it was like a Claret wine, but you can use a Malbec or a Shiraz. Mm -hmm. Okay, now in the Chicago Fizz, some similarities here. Traditionally, it would be white rum, but you know we love our vodka on Breeders' Cup, so we're going to do Tito's Vodka. There's some port wine, but then again, we have lemon juice and simple syrup, and we're going to add an egg white. But So those two common elements, Brittany, you already know what they are. No, I don't. I just wanted to give a <laughs> shout out because you keep talking about Chicago, and our good friend Eric Barlin from Tito's is from Chicago. He's such yeah. a reporter of the Breeders' Cup horse racing, everything, and just an all-around good guy. So had to say awesome. hello and a shout-out to him. Anyway. There you go. Like, like Nick said, we, we brought up full circle. There's a method to our madness here. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and start. We're gonna, what we're going to do here is we're going to add three-quarters of an ounce of lemon juice to two separate mixing tins. So this is what's different here. We're going to build two cocktails at the same time. So three-quarters of an ounce into one, and then again, three-quarters of an ounce into another. So that's one of our two common elements in these cocktails. As you guys know, this kind of normal sour construct, when we have the sour, we need the sweet. So we're going to add a half ounce of simple syrup into both tins as well. So effectively, we're building two cocktails here at the same time. So this and is then, what you would be doing at a bar. I mean, how many cocktails at a time do you have to make typically? Sometimes you can do up to five, six cocktails. Yeah, someone will come up and say... Uh, I want a Cosmo, Apple Martini, Lemon Drop, uh, Long Island Iced Tea, 
you know, it, it can get a little nightmarish at times, sure. but when you kind of understand those common elements, what you want to do is sort of build them all together. And almost like you're in a kitchen, you want to add the ice at the last second and then shake it all up. So the fact that we've been doing that all throughout the show, you never see me adding the ice first unless it's a built drink. One mm -hmm. of the reasons for that is it allows us to prep all of these drinks. And then right when they're all going to be fresh, that's when we shake them up, stir them up and serve them. Same way you don't want one dish coming out to a table and that person starts eating and then everybody else gets their food five minutes later. We try to do the same thing with drinks. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So now we get a little bit more to the hard stuff here. First, we are going to add one ounce of port wine. And this is, you can really do it in either tin at this point, but this is going to be for the Chicago sour. So of course, port wine is that sweet fortified wine from Portugal. It's a great after dinner drink just by itself. But it's going to add a lot of complexity to this cocktail too. How much okay. port can you? How much port can you take on its own, Mark? Uh, I, I mean, probably about maybe an ounce and a half tops. It's sweet. Yeah. It's like if you do sauternes or something like that. You know, it's nice with dessert, but y yeah, you can't can't guzzle that stuff down. <laughs> Don't mind All me. Right. I just have a fly that I really need to get rid of. No. So now we get to our our really boozy stuff. So you can see that oh, we're working that. our way up. From the there's a man on there's a man on message. Yeah. <laughs> there's a man on message. Just get a <laughs> screen grab of that. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, all right. Yeah. So we are going to add two ounces of maker's mark into the tin that only has the lemon juice and the simple syrup. That's our whiskey sour tin. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing is you want to keep track at this point when you have differences of which tin you're pouring into. You might have so that. So sour in a New York fizz by the time you're done with this. <laughs> uh, I got to tell you, it's happened. It's happened. On a busy night at the bar, that's the danger. Sometimes you get it twisted, but we try to keep it straight. <laughs> All right. So now, finally, for the, the uh, Chicago fizz, we're adding one ounce of Tito's. And the only difference here is that I'm going to add an egg white to the Chicago fizz tin. We're not going to do it in the whiskey sour this time. So Thank you. Egg had white is going the egg white mm -hmm. situation last time, didn't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought I did all right with my egg white. I I wasn't going to try it again, but <laughs> I I was hoping for a nice froth, and I got more more of a sort of little. But you know what? You you had the froth. I keep saying this. It was there. It just didn't come mm. out. Which sometimes it it happens in certain types of shakers. You develop the froth, and you just can't get into the glass. But all right. So the. We're, we're going to do a dry shake, as we like to do with uh, egg white drinks. That's going to help the emulsification. Remember, a dry shake is when you shake without ice. So this is a preliminary shake. See no sound going on here. This is going to start that foam going. Now, for those of you guys that don't want to do the egg white, remember, you can always use the water from a can of chickpeas. That's called aquafaba. And that is a great vegan alternative for creating that foam. So don't feel like you can't make this drink if you don't want to do the egg white. So, All right. how, so how much foam have you generated just by doing that? But just by doing a dry shake, how much it's, foam it's, do you create? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I would say it's like that much. If I try to show you the foam in there, I'm going to pour it on my, my Mac. But uh, yeah, it's, you, you, you can already see it started. So now the great thing is that both of these tins have complete cocktails in. So now we're going to add ice and we're going to shake them at the same time. So again, this is all about that process of sort of streamlining the operations here. Have your stats? No. Oh yeah, I mean I've got I've got all sorts of kinds of stuff yeah. we can do with, with Kenny McPeak. Go for it. He's not, he, two, two he's, not two two he's not He's not he's not here, but in in homage to Kenny McPeak. I maybe mean, it we, depends how. Go on. Maybe we should give some shout outs to our uh, our viewers. List well, off all their names. Definitely. In fact, uh, that's the best idea you've had all season. I know they're very so, far, few and far between. Nick, Jennifer, Jennifer Pinkerton Cook uh, suggests froth as a horse name. Froth. Chicago fizz. Chicago, Chicago fizz is nice. Chicago fizz is nice. Did did we lose Mark? Oh God, is Mark frozen in time? <laughs> yes. Oh no, 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 no! Just at the point of no return as well. He's going to have to. That's a great. Refroth, reason though. Shake it all up again. Look at how happy he looks in this freeze frame. Though. I know. If 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 you and I, you or I had frozen, we would have frozen in the most unholy kind of pose. Like yeah. 
Like, it would have been uncomfortable. Um, yeah, it would have been. It would have been shocking. Um, I very much enjoyed talking to both our guests this evening as we try to get the mark back. Fantastic. I mean, it's, we always say this, it's a long show, it's an hour, you know, I think it's a little daunting when we tell those guests that are coming on for the full hour, but then we realize, oh dear, we only have them for half an hour, 25 minutes time, and we need more um, because there's so many stories, there's so much ground to, uh, grounds to cover. Um, it's been suggested by Robert Segura, who's watched this show every week, every week, all 18 editions, hasn't missed one, that uh, we, re <laughs> we, re we replace <laughs> Mark Tuberty with his wife, who I think we've heard out of shot, but have never, never actually seen. No, she's refused to be on the show, I think, as well as your lovely wife, Laura. What if we just kicked the men off the show for, you know, a little bit and then had a ladies cocktail hour? I, I don't think anyone would be objecting to that. Um, Trisha Hill suggests Frozen in Time, a good name for a racehorse, Jimmy McDonald. See what happens when you save the drinks to last. Keep the faith, Jimmy. We're going to get him back. back. It's just that it's just that sultry heat in in that beautiful, too cool for school Brooklyn apartment that is taking this show apart at the moment. But we'll have it right back. John yeah. Patrick says Brittany is. Oh no, I'm not reading that one out. Uh, Warren <laughs> Perez. So this is a Chicago, New York, and Kentucky drink with makers. Yes. Paulette Klein, hi from Florida, native of Chicago. Uh, Kathy, Katie says uh, he's shaking it. He is. Um, first Windy City girl, horse named Chicago Fizz. Who else have we got watching today? Tom Sweeney. Ah, now this is an important point. Tom says, good show. Please don't throw dirt on Arlington Park just yet. The million will return next year, but no guarantee after 2021. Save Arlington. So I suppose if they can get somebody to mobilize ah oh, there he is somebody to mobilize quickly enough then maybe. oh my goodness how about, about how about suspense on that i'm so yeah. sorry guys uh, you were you were kind of stuck like this yeah. it was a great <laughs> frame though really was you you were sort of off. Right. you were sort of you 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 were sort of semi frothed yeah <laughs> well I, I apologize guys did you read off some stats in the meantime or not no, yet? I, was I, I was i was waiting for you to finish it off all right <laughs> So I did, I went ahead and poured them while I was waiting for my, my uh, computer to boot up because okay. I didn't want to be too behind. But what you All can right. do is read those stats while I top both off. So we're doing two things. With the Chicago Fizz, we're going to top that off with club soda. That's going to make it a Fizz. It's a and, drink. Right? It's a really cool color. The port wine adds a lot to it. The other thing we're doing, so right now we have a whiskey sour here. What we want to do is take that red wine that we have and Nick, you mentioned this last week. We want to yeah. take the spoon and put that just on the inside of the glass on top of yeah. the sour. That's so what we did. With, that's what we did with the cream. And I we tried to, I tried to do it with an espresso martini last uh, yeah. a couple of nights ago. Okay. And it worked. Um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. So we're, again, we're taking advantage of the different densities of these liquids. The whiskey sour has the sugar, so it's going to be richer. It's going to sit at the bottom. The wine is going to be lighter, so we're going to float that on top. It is going to take me a minute to do both of these. So, Nick, whenever you're ready, if you want to start in those I'm stats. Gonna, I'm going to – no, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Mark. While you were away, Brittany yeah. had a better idea. I'm going to read out everyone who's contributed tonight because we've got some – Fantastic. Some, some people have been with us the whole season. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I mean, they're, awesome. They're, dwind, they're dwindling by the week, but the hardcore <laughs> – like five left. Oh, awesome. yeah. Sounds good. Let me get going on these. Get that wrist going, Mark. Yep. All right. Oh, you can go ahead. I'm just, I'm topping it off here. <laughs> oh, you're topping it off. Okay. All yeah. right. Here we are, Brittany. We're going to give a shout out to Joan Ludlow, who says, Tis the law. Yay. Julie Ingle, who's with us every week. Julie. Joan Mathia. Tis the law is a boss on a mission. Mahendra Uday is watching from Guyana. Kim McGeorge. McGeorge is from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Lynn Robeson. Greetings from Texas. Hello to you, Lynn. Sarah Dickinson. New horse name. You show me yours. I like it. Uh, Joe, again, I was thinking about when we were reopening the bar. Stephen Wardle, keep your mask off, Brittany, please. Again, Katie says, hey, Kenny, great view. Hello, McPeaks. That looks idyllic. It did. Kenny McPeaks' view over the Saratoga Lake looked amazing today. Uh, Den Norton, he's obviously tuned in for the first time. Wow, who's Brittany? Is she, <laughs> Somebody is she, said, what is she doing here? She doesn't is she, fit. <laughs> is, is she single? Robert Segura, mum's birthday, 82, ready for the Alabama. Jeff Hall, yo, Kenny, welcome. Joan Ludlow, I love your T-shirt, Mr. McPeak. That's one for you, Kenny. Uh, 
Jennifer Cook's in town. Alison Tarrant, Ryan Cool says 15 Church is awesome. Is it the best restaurant in Saratoga? I've never been. Okay. I love uh, salt, salt and char. Uh huh. Obligatory salt and char reference. That's a, <laughs> another another free dinner there. Uh, Jennifer Pinning Pings and Cook, uh, social <laughs> shown us it. Shones is there. Uh, James Paragoid, uh, Jennifer again, James Hamill, um, Katie, Jeff Hall, John Fulton uh, is explaining who Brittany is. Uh, Jennifer again, Alison Tarrant, Jeff Hall, Leslie has been with us every week. James, um, Amy Lasky's in town again. Uh, thank you, Amy. Julie Ingle, MJ Peters, Mary Jane McKittrick's in, in the in the house. Mary Jane. The Dickinsons, I'm sure you oh, mentioned. Oh, the Dickinsons are with us. Dickinsons, every... they're, they're on vacation this week, but they're still watching. I think they're in Colorado, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Ka Carol like Babinski. number one cocktails and conversation viewers. <gasps> yeah. You can't say that because you're reckoning we out without Julie Ingle and Trisha Hill and Robert Segura and Stan Stinson and um, Aiden Butler, of course. Watches every week. And poor, uh, Bella Gregory, she was watching earlier, may not have commented. Yeah. Team San Anita is supporting us. Oh, yeah. Um, awesome. And any, anyone I've forgotten, I'm sorry. Uh, Deborah Krastek is in the house. Gord Walker, Randy Carter, John Patrick, Warren Perez, Paulette Klein. It's like whose line is it anyway with a piano at the end, isn't it? Do you remember that? No, you're too, you're too young to remember that. Jillian Smith says, horse racing needs more shows like this, informative fun, and makes people feel connected. Jillian, thank you. And Jimmy McDonald, this show is the best thing to come out of 2020. You know what? I, I awesome. think this is the best thing I've gotten to do in 2020. So big thank you to everybody that put it together and those of you watching. An overarching thank you if we missed anybody. Yeah, we, we haven't uh, finished yet either. Like we got uh, the plan is do I do I reveal the plan or am I not allowed to reveal the plan? Yeah, before no. you reveal the plan, can we touch on one thing that Kenny mentioned that I do want to wait before, before that moment? Mark, showcase your drinks. All right, so we've got our fizz. Now you can see that at this point, that foam has extended over the top of the glass, which is oh a great my sign. god, that's a great sign of a fizz. The way you get that is by de the developing the foam in the glass, and when you add the club soda, it pushes it up. The one thing I'll say about that is don't get too greedy because sometimes I try to get it so it's like two inches and then it falls over and it makes a mess. So I'd say a good half inch is awesome. And I have to admit that I made a mistake here because I got a red wine that actually is pretty high in the sugar content. So when I went to float it on top, it did an interesting thing as they'll do and it sunk to the bottom, but still we have two layers. Ooh, it's still gorgeous. Yep, so that's sort of a, a backwards New York style there. That you're being you're being quite modest because we're only getting a little glimpse of your layering. Let me have a look at it again. It's amazing. Yeah. So look at that. Perfection. That's, that's like, very impressive. Cocktails are artwork. Oh, thank you, and thank you for your patience. I didn't mean to cause so much suspense tonight, but. And can I have a look at your big foamy thing again? Oh, the fizz, yeah. So I'm gonna try to get that close so you can see. That's ridiculous. Isn't that awesome? Gorgeous. How the hell do you do that? Yep, so a lot of that is just getting that good foam, doing the dry shake first, then the shake with ice, let the foam settle a little bit, and when you pour that club soda in, it's going to lift that up above the glass. So, And both of those drinks at the same time, so that's how you could go about, if you get two different drink orders from your guests at home, try to look for those things that are common elements. It's like math, but more fun. So the common der derivative, finding the lemon juice, the simple syrup, other ingredients that match up, do those first, and then build the cocktail up. Yeah. I have an idea. Yeah. Well, because Nick's going to give us an update on the shows, but I'm thinking if we can all be in Kentucky together for the Breeders' Cup, that we should have two separate socially distanced stations and one cocktail that Nick and I are each going to make, and you do the taste test. Oh, that sounds awesome. I'm I looking forward to that already. Can I, I, can I have a big board with, like, numbers that I can do, like, a 9 or a 10? <laughs> Maybe just a big thumbs down for Nick. So, no, I'm sorry. Worked, thumbs yeah. up. Or thumbs up. Thumbs up. I, I've, won, I've sort of. It's brilliant this 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 idea because I've kind of worked out how this is going to go, and I've realised that I may as well just, you know, hold up a sign around my neck, uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I think that's pretty much how the whole thing will, will pan out. Um, but yes, I'm no, I'm looking forward to it. Um, That'd be awesome. Awesome. There's there's some kind of bug flying around. Yeah, there is. It's a, it's, oh. it's a, a, it traveled from Brittany's area. Yeah. Brittany, you you had one too. I'm still dealing with it. Yeah, <laughs> it's extremely annoying. It's only it's a bog standard fly. That's all. Nothing very exotic. 
Uh, oh, but the one thing I did want to touch on that Kenny McPeak mentioned earlier, he was talking about the coach, D. Wayne Lucas. Um, his grandson took to Twitter a couple of days ago to say that um, the coach had tested positive for COVID-19 and he's on the road to recovery and hoping to get back to the barn soon. So just wanted to send out all of our thoughts to uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest trainer of all time, the coach. Um, he's set to celebrate a birthday um, sometime Kentucky Derby week, I believe. So speedy recovery for Mr. D Wayne. Yeah, ab Ooh. absolutely. And I know yeah, just like we've had, we've had so much fun on this show, but you know, every, every so often we get a stark reminder of why we were, why we were here in the first place. And, yeah. and yeah, I, I don't want to start. Um, I don't want to start getting too, too uh, emotional at this late hour, but it was a fantastic idea from, uh, our bosses at Breeders' Cup, and uh, yeah, we we owe them a big thank you for keeping us sane as well as um, in gainful, well, in employment. <laughs> so actually, tomorrow night, if you can believe it, I'll be doing two back-to-back -back cocktail classes online. So someone's gonna have to listen to me speak for an hour and a half, <laughs> if you can believe that. So I'm trying it. to go ex extra geeky. It. They will uh, learn a lot. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> So, so do you want to go on? Oh, so I did do the, uh, I, I submitted it, which was this past Sunday. I stayed up until two o'clock in the morning working on the submission because the deadline was midnight Pacific time. So of course I'm Eastern time. And then the next day they extended the deadline by five days. So, <laughs> but I got it in. I'm excited. I've had uh, over the past couple of years, I've had some good luck with cocktail competitions. So I'm hoping to keep that rolling, but I'm, yeah, I'm excited for it. Okay. We'll keep us posted. Absolutely. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, is there a link? Was there a link we can? Uh, not yet. Let's let's see if I if I advance and then I'll I'll keep you updated and we'll try to try to loop you guys in. But right now we're just knocking on wood. Um, da -da -da. Jennifer just said and and quite rightly just prompted me to remind you that we can we can all make donations still as well. Breederscup.com forward slash donate supporting COVID nineteen relief efforts across the horse racing industry and hospitality uh, and. Uh, very important charities they are as well. Breederscup.com forward slash donate. How's the industry picking itself up at the moment, Mark? Your industry. You know, it's it's getting there. It, it's tricky at the moment because obviously each area of the country is in a very different situation right now. Um, New York, we're still looking okay in the tri-state area has, has been doing well as far as the, the level of COVID-19 that we're seeing. Um, but at the moment that we were going to reopen indoor dining, for instance, they noticed that we were seeing these surges throughout the rest of the country. And so Governor Cuomo said, let's hold up, stick with the outdoor dining for now. It's still nice outside. So we're kind of rolling with that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of on pause. So uh, again, we have some great opportunities that are presenting themselves in a virtual manner. But as far as my restaurant, I still don't know. Um, crossing my fingers, but yeah, maybe in September, October, uh, they might make that decision to start up indoor dining again. Yeah, well, hopefully, as long as everyone's staying safe and healthy out there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we're finally um, the update, Nick. Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask you: Have you, Brittany? Have you had a chance to? Have you been out much? I mean, have you been? Have you eaten out much? Have you? You know, what's the kind of, what's the vibe like with you? Well, San Diego is getting much closer to the point where they could be taken off the watch list that we have here in California. There are certain counties and they have to get their numbers on par with what the governor wants to see or, or less than. So um, in San Diego County, it's only outdoor dining, very similar to what you're seeing in a lot of um, the country. L.A. is the same way. And I've kind of love it, loved it. I mean, we're in an area where the weather is beautiful. We really can't complain. And the weather's pretty much nice year round. You only get very few rainy days out here. So outdoor dining, I, I love, I and mean, you've seen a lot of restaurants pivot. Um, we're going to a restaurant uh, later tomorrow to celebrate a friend's birthday, and they've completely reconfigured their parking lot. So there's an outdoor patio now that was never there. So you're seeing a lot of that here. Um, it's, it's different though. You can't go to a lot of your favorite restaurant. Bars are completely non-existent. When you say, hey, where can we go to grab a drink? You, you can't, you have to be sitting down with a reservation, having food. It's just, um, it's very different from a social aspect, but mm. people, restaurants, you, you're pivoting in the best way that you can. Lots of picnics, lots of uh, outdoor events, beach time, all of the above. So uh, we yeah. all try to make the best of it, you know? Mm. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, I hope everyone's managing to keep safe and sane. I was going to bring you up to speed with our plans for the show, mm -hmm. which are, as things stand, drum roll, please. So we are now on show 18, would you believe it? And there are two more shows before a small break. So I think we're going to do next week and the week after, and then uh, it's derby time, so things are going to get hectic. So I think we're going to take a little break, and then we will be back sort of mid to late September for a little more. Yeah, no, I think, it's, I think it's perfect. I think it will um, give us a chance to have plenty of plenty to discuss when we come back talking about the Kentucky Derby. So we will be approaching episode 20 shortly, which is wild. Can you guys believe that? Crazy. And we, when Crazy. we just look back on some of the guests we've had, the who's who in racing industry and the stories that they have shared. Um, I think it's going to be really fun to look back on some of our, you know, some of the highlights yeah. from the 20 shows. We, we should do a highlight show and then also a blooper show. But all of our bloopers are live anyway, so you've seen them before, but we can condense them so that you can see us acting aren't they funny the, all at aren't one they time. The same, aren't they the same thing? <laughs> I, think, I think they are. Yes. I think they are. <laughs> all right. The fan egg challenge. Yeah. I, I can think of a few moments right off the bat that would make it in there, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, guys, thanks so much again. Um, I think that's pretty much us done. That is it. Um, we will be back same time. Uh, I was going to say same place, but it won't be the same place for me because I will be in York next week. So I will be coming to oh. you from a small hotel room with unreliable Wi-Fi. We make it work. And I think, <laughs> I think like the words are understanding. Yeah. <laughs> and Absolutely. Brittany will be having another I'm beautiful backdrop. Yeah. And uh, Mark will be sweltering in Brooklyn. Yep. <laughs> As always. Um, Guys, take care. Lots of love. We'll see you again next week. Night-night. All right. Happy Thursday. Take care.